We've been journeying together through Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. The title of the message is, it's just never too bad. The title of the series is, never say never. Never say never that that person won't come to Christ. Never say never that that person will not change their life. Never say never. And so, so we get to this section of scripture, Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 and 3, and, we, and all of a sudden we come to this issue and we title the message, never too bad. Because when we come to a place where, 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 where Jonah, the fact is these three verses have, are difficult to understand. And that's why we're going to deal with it this morning. They're difficult to understand. It takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of work to get through these three verses. Now, this is Jonah's response. These three verses are Jonah's response when he preaches a sermon that God gives him. It's an eight-word sermon in the English. It's a five-word sermon in the Hebrew. He preaches this message, and like the whole city, like, like, repents. They respond by turning to God. God shows mercy. God shows grace. God shows forgiveness. God shows compassion. And then all of a sudden, Jonah gets upset. I mean, it's like, what is up with Jonah? Why would you get upset over something like that? You see, see, the first part of Jonah's story, I get. The first part of Jonah's story, I completely understand. One of my goals in this series is to try to cause you to look at Jonah differently than you've ever looked at Jonah before. There are some core issues. There are some core things in the book of Jonah that I believe are like life-changing when we understand them. But the first part of Jonah, I totally get. Over the last several weeks, we've been journeying through the first part of Jonah, and we understand God is loving and God is gracious, God is compassionate, God is kind, um, God is forgiving, and because of his love and his forgiveness and his compassion, he chooses to call the city of Nineveh to, to repentance, and as a result of that, they do, and God shows his grace on them, and what this tells us is this, is God not only loves the children of Israel, but he loves all people, that he loves all nations. And we see his love and his mercy extended to an area where, quite frankly, Jonah didn't think it should be extended to. And so when God calls Jonah to go and preach to them repentance, Jonah doesn't want to do it. And the reason he doesn't want to do it is because he thinks, you know what, they're evil. The last thing he wants is is to do is to preach this message to a group of evil, vile people in in his book, in his mind. In other words, Jonah got to the place where he thought this, their sin was much worse than his sin. Their actions were much worse than his actions. In other words, Jonah got to this place in his life to where he thought these people, this group of people, this, man, I'm so against them. I'm so against everything they stand for. I'm so against everything that they do. And as a result of that, I don't think God's grace, God's love, God's compassion should be extended to them. And so he simply says, God, I'm out. He taps out. He says, God, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And so he runs, and so God sends a storm to, to turn him around. We've learned this in this series. Storms in your life are not to judge you. Uh, storms are brought into your life many times to, to, to correct or to, to bring good out of it, to rescue you. And so Jonah runs. God sends a storm, and the sailors pitch him overboard. God provides a whale, swallows him. Vomits him out on a beach. We looked at that last week. He repents and he says, God, I'm, I'm going to Nineveh. And so he repents and we learned that repentance is just like a military term. It means an about face. In other words, it means a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. Jonah had run. fact is, God called Jonah to go 500 miles to Nineveh. He goes 2,500 miles the opposite direction. In, in other words, this, Jonah would rather be 2,500 miles outside of God's will rather than 500 miles inside of God's will. And so, God, and so Jonah comes to the place, and he, he repents, and, um, and repentance is brought to the, the, the people of Nineveh. And so for me, this story is easy up to understand up until this point. And then it gets kind of dicey for me. I mean, I, I, can, I can totally relate running from God. God called me into the ministry. I was in engineering at the time in 1983. God called me into the ministry. I did not want to go. The call was clear on my life. I was happy in my job. I was happy in, in my profession. I was happy where I lived. I was happy with all of that. And so I, I did not want to go. And as a result of that, I ran from God from 1983 to 1995 when I finally surrendered to the ministry, left Texas, and came here. You're like, that's no big loss leaving Texas. (laughs) Why wouldn't you? Anyway, (laughs) I was one of the few Texans. I'd never been to Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was one of the few Texans. The first time I moved, I, I was in Colorado was when I, like, moved here. And you guys are used to call it to Texans invading this place all the time. 
And so, so I, I understand running from God, right? I understand that, that God, God had a call on my life, and, and I ran. And I know the storms that it created because of that. But there's been other times in my life, if I'm honest, and maybe if you're honest, there's been other times in my life it was clear God called me to do something. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it because of the heartache, the pain, how tough the decision was. I didn't want to do it for a, a lot of reasons. And, and I suffered some storms as a result of that. Listen, not every, you don't have to go through every storm that we go through in life. That's the story of Jonah. And so maybe, maybe you can relate. Maybe you can relate to where there, there's been times in your life that you sat in a church service and it was clear God called you to do something. God wanted you to do something. And you may have even in that service and in that moment said, God, I'm doing it. I'm on it. But then Monday rolls around, right? And it's like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe God's called you to have a conversation with someone. Maybe God's called you to quit doing something. Maybe God's called you to do something different, whatever it is. And so we can all relate at a, at a, at a level of saying there, there, there have been times when God called us to do something, and for whatever reason, we didn't want to do it. And so I get this concept clearly that God's leading us to do something. We know that he's leading us to do it, <coughs> and so we don't do it for whatever reason. But after Jonah repents... And after Jonah says, I'll do it. And then there's this unbelievable response as a result of that. And, and Jonah gets mad. I'd never really understood this. We're going to understand it this morning. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, just a little bit of the context. Here's what happened when they actually repented. When God saw what they did, so repentance, about face, change of mind leads to a change of direction. They changed some things. How they turned. That's another word for repentance, turned away, uh, turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. In other words, God shows grace, God shows love, God shows mercy, and then all of a sudden, look at how Jonah responds. I mean, this should be a happy day, right? Especially, especially if you do that for a living, especially if that's your profession. Uh, verse 1, at chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. In the Hebrew, man, this is like, in t this, isn't just, this isn't just upset. This is intense anger that they repented. In other words, Jonah's not having a good day. Jonah's having a bad day. Last week, I had a really, really, really bad day. And so sometimes what helps is Chinese food, cheap Chinese food. I, uh, you give, anyway, you don't care. When it comes to Chinese food, I go for quantity, not quality. I'm just telling you. And so it adds character, right? So I, I, went, and got, I went and got Chinese food. And so you know how you get the, 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 the fortune cookie at the end of the meal? I cracked that fortune cookie open, and you know what? There wasn't a fortune in there. <laughs> you know you're having a bad day when your fortune cookie does not have a fortune in it. That is a bad day. I called the waitress over. We got to fix this right now. I need another cookie, and I need one with a fortune in it. And I got another cookie. I cracked it open, and it did not help. It, did not, it didn't even speak to the situation. So Jonah... Jonah's like in a Chinese restaurant with a fortune cookie without a fortune. And he's upset. And so this is still just shocking to me. I mean, can you believe it? He preaches, a, he preaches an eight-word message in the English, a five-word message in the Hebrew. And like the whole city repents. And he gets angry. So you have to ask yourself, Jonah, what is up with you? Why are you angry? I mean, I mean this is like a preacher's dream. This is like, this, in preaching, this is like winning the Super Bowl. You'd be on a book tour. You'd be doing talk shows. I mean, can you imagine how wonderful it would be if I preach an eight-word message? You say, you, you say glory right there, right? You say, amen, preach on, just eight. <laughs> how wonderful would it be if I preached an eight-word message and the whole city of Pueblo comes to Christ? We have to move our services to the event center. We're doing multiple services throughout the weekend, just trying to get everybody in because the whole city is coming. We're going out to the reservoir, and we got thousands of people. We have people lined up, and, and it's no longer a boat ramp for us. We're using it as a, to baptize people. And so we, you'd think, you know what? We would, like, we would be exceeding, not exceedingly angry. We'd be exceedingly happy. And yet you look at Jonah, and I'm reading this, and I'm like, Jonah, what is wrong with you? What, what is the big deal? This is, this is why you preach. 
This is why you do ministry. This is why you surrender to the call. This is why you left and went 2,500 miles to Nineveh. I mean, it took a lot to get there. That's why you worked. That's why you got there. And then, then why are you, I, I don't get this. And, and then it hit me. It's like Jonas, it's no longer about people, is it? It's about your opinions. It's, it's about your, your judgments. Jonah, have you, have you been in ministry? Have you been a Christian so long that you become cynical and you become jaded? And you look at some people and you say, because I disagree with them, because I don't like them, because I stand for everything they're for, or I stand against everything that they're for. Then I don't think the grace and the love of God should be extended to that group of people. To that person. And, and if, you want, if you want more insight. Verse 2. And so, and so Jonah prays and he prayed to the Lord. And he said, oh Lord, is this not what I said? And in other words, told you so. When I was yet in my country. That this is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful. Slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And relenting from disaster. Jonah's like, I told you. I told you you're going to extend your grace to this group of people that I hate. This group of people that I, I've deemed evil. This group of people that I don't think your grace should be extended to. And I knew they would repent. You, you know why Jonah knew that? Because that's the God he experienced. He had experienced God's love. He had experienced God's grace. Even when he turned his back on God and went 2,500 miles the opposite direction. God ran after him. God pursued him. And when he repented, God showed him grace and forgiveness and compassion. That's how he knew. And so, you're like, Jonah's like, God, you made me go to Nineveh. And you know what this tells us? You can still do God's will and be angry about it. Jonah developed something in his heart. Why would anybody get mad? That God's going to extend grace to a group of people. God's not going to destroy a group of people. God's not going to destroy a city. Jonah's disgust and hatred for these people was so real to him. Others around him could see it and they would, that he would rather see God destroy them than for them to come to repentance and see mercy and forgiveness. If we're not careful, we can become just as jaded. And we can become just as cynical. And you can see the, the, sin, the sinful response in, in our heart if we're not careful to a person or a group of people. And the question is, what makes you want to go to Tarshish? When you're hurt, when you're wronged, what makes you want to go to Tarshish? I see this response more and more common in culture and in politics and the public square Social media, that I'm becoming to believe, <laughs> it's of Satan most of the time. That may be my age, I get it, I understand. But there's, there's just so much out there where people trashing one another. People judging one another. Occasionally you can see it in the church, how the church views the world. You can have a ton of people that genuinely love God and they're the real deal. They're in church every weekend. They even serve in ministry. And they love people. They say they, they, say they love God, love people, expect, except when it comes to those people, except when it comes to that person outside of the church. When it comes to that person, I, I love God, I love people, expect, except for that person or that group of people that I, that I fear that I disagree with, I disagree with their politics, I disagree with their lifestyle, I disagree with how they live their life, how they hurt me, how they wrong me. So see, the question of Jonah is, what makes you flee to Tarshish in your heart? Do you have 
those people outside of the, of the church, those people, that you don't know if you think the love of God should, become, should be extended to them. Most of us are, if most of us are honest, from time to time we can struggle with that. And we, we may cover it up with some Christian lingo language, but we do not love that person or that group of people. And when those people come in contact with us, they know. They know we really don't love them. Is there a person or a group of people that we don't want to see come to Christ, repent, and find forgiveness, and we honestly want them punished? See, the question of Jonah, and it's just so convicting, I get it, I understand it. What makes you want to go to Tarshish? I can tell you this story. It happened 15 years ago. I, it was public. It was in the papers. Um, I also have permission from the individual. But 15 years ago, we had a wonderful family in our church, and uh, they served in ministry here. At the time, he was a District 70 super, superintendent. He was out at the Pueblo Reservoir with his family. They were camping. He had two minors, his daughter and his, friend, his daughter's friend in the back of the pickup. He has an accident. Both kids were ejected. From the vehicle, he, he left the scene. Uh, we, we were called that night by his family. Uh, Karen, I had to preach the next morning. Was, we, we were called Sunday morning at 1 in the morning. Uh, so Karen went to Parkview Hospital. She spent the night there with, with his wife and daughter and helped them through that, that ordeal. Uh, that next morning, he was arrested. He immediately lost his job, and because he had a high-profile position in our community, it was on the front page of the papers. It was carried over and over and over. But yet he's go to our church. And so he spent 60 days in the county jail. And for 60 days, in that time, my, my schedule was much different. I was able to do these things. In that 60-day period, I, I, I got special access into the jail. And I visited him straight 60 days. Every day I was in the jail with him. When he went to trial, uh, Karen and I sat with his family. We supported his family. I was, I was a character witness. In other words, I, I, I told what I knew to be true about him. And I was amazed in our community, the number of people in our community, that the last thing they wanted to see extended to him was the love of God. The last thing they wanted to see extended to him was grace and forgiveness and poured out on him. See, this is the exact thing that Jonah is going through. What's going on in his heart, in Jonah's heart, I'm thinking, Jonah, what is wrong with you? Why, why wouldn't you want to see God's grace shown on these people? And then I realized it may be more prevalent in our culture than I think. It's, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a proponent of justice. That's not what this text means. I'm not saying we don't fight evil in society. When people are oppressed or marginalized or abused, uh, it's biblical to pursue justice. I'm not saying that there should not be justice. I mean, that's, that's the picture of the cross, justice and mercy, justice and forgiveness. So I'm not, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying any of that, but here's what I'm saying. The reason the story is in the Bible is to demonstrate that, guess what? God, lo God loves all people. And if we're not careful, we'll forget that. That God has a desire for men and women and boys and girls to come to a saving faith of Jesus Christ. And it's easy to forget that. Jonah forgot that. And as his children, we should be a group of people that don't long for the wrath of God to be poured out on a group of people. Poured out on our personal Ninevites. What makes the gospel so sweet and so amazing is it extends grace, hope, and mercy where none should be extended. Why should that not be our desire? Because you and I at one time deserved the wrath of God, but he didn't pour it out on us, and that should be our longing in our heart for our enemies. Many times we, we want mercy for ourselves and justice for them. And again, just so I'm clear, I'm not saying you don't pursue justice. We pursue justice in the fullest extent of the law when the law has been broken. I am talking about our hearts, not just, I am talking about our hearts towards that person. 
What is your heart? What is your attitude towards that person? Do you want to see the grace of God change them? Or do you only want to see them be punished? We look at the story of Jonah and he's mad that God showed grace to this group of people. And we think, why would he be angry until, until we encounter our Ninevites? And we, until we encounter people who have hurt us? And here's what I see oftentimes in our culture. In the spirit of pursuing justice and pursuing what is right and true and good. Because we've been so fed up with the evil of this world. We've moved to the heart of Jonah and we've lost the heart of the truer or the better Jonah, whose name is Jesus Christ, who told us, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. In the Sermon on the Mount, which was a difficult sermon, and, and it's the most amazing sermon that Jesus ever preached, he said these words, and, and, and I'll read some scripture out of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, he said you have heard that it was said, to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. In other words, it's Matthew 18 in Matthew chapter 5, working together, Matthew 18 says that if someone, if, if someone uh, hurts you, that you go to him. But, but the Sermon on the Mount takes it deeper. If you know you've offended something, you, someone, you go to them. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say that you do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. But if anyone would sue you take, and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Matthew 5, 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For, it is, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do you not... E do not even the tax collectors do the same? Simple question. You engage your Ninevites in this way. So many people are about the Sermon on the Mount. When it applies to us, we have difficulty when it applies to others. When it applies to those people that have wounded us or oppressed us. And Jesus gave us the why that we should do this. Verse 45, he says, So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. When you and I, when you are a child of God, it's not about how you treat the people you love. It's about how you treat the people you don't love. How you treat your enemies. How you treat those that persecute you. I know. I personally know what it's like to flee to Tarshish. I know what it's like to be hurt or wounded, that I developed a Jonah spirit in my life. Someone wounds you, someone wounds your family. It's like, God, I want, I want, to, I want to take them out. I want you to go Old Testament on them in Jesus' name. <laughs> and so I want you to know that I get it. And if you're here this morning and say, you know what, I, I just can't do it. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know how, hurt, how deep the hurt is. Jesus just didn't pre preach, love your enemies. He lived it out. I, I, I think of the time in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he goes to the cross, he's agonizing what God has called him to do the next day. And he's praying and he's saying, God, if there's any way this cup can pass before me, let it pass before me. God says, no, you got to do it. It's my will. It's the only way. Jesus says, it's not your will. It's my will. So he gets up. His accusers are coming in. The, the people, his accusers are coming in. And Jesus, Jesus uh, starts walking up to them, and, and Simon Peter pulls out his sword and cuts his ear off. I, I actually think Simon Peter wasn't a very good marksman. He was going for the neck and just got the ear. Uh, that's, that's, that's not in Scripture. That's just what I believe. And so, he, and so look at this, verse 50, Luke chapter 22, verse 50. And one of them, see, Luke was kind. He didn't call out Simon Peter. Another gospel writer does. He just said, and one of them. And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus says, no more of this. And he touched his ear and he, and he healed him. Here the guy is coming to arrest him. 
They're going to beat him. They're going to torture him uh, all night long. The next day, they're going to crucify him. <laughs> and Jesus heals him. No scriptural evidence. This is just my personal opinion. I'm willing to bet that guard, when Jesus put his ear back on, became a Christ follower at that moment. I think we'll see him in heaven. I think he'll walk around and say, hey, I'm the dude that whacked off that. I'm the dude that Simon Peter whacked off my ear. And Jesus put it on. And when I saw that, when I saw the love and the forgiveness and the compassion, I became a Christ follower that night. Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what I'm doing. Do you know the story of the man that failed him over and over, denied him, abandoned him, walked away from him, times refused to follow him, ran away from Jesus. And Jesus continued to reach out and pursue him. Jesus continued to reach out and go after him. Do you know who that is? That's me, and that's you. That's how come Jonah knew the love and the compassion of God and what he was going to do. Romans 5, 7 says this. It says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God knows his, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, God, Christ died for us. Since therefore we now have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now that we were reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? Jesus did not die for a bunch of good people. Jesus died for a bunch of bad people. And you're never too bad for his love. You're never too bad for his forgiveness. You want to know what happened to that District 70 superintendent? Kind of left the story hanging. He did his time. He was on probation. He had 500 hours of community service that he had to perform. Uh, he, he did that here. He served that, and we worked it out with the courts. He served that through our church. Lost his job, lost his reputation. You know where he is today? He's, a, he's in Indiana teaching at a Bible college. And he's an associate pastor of a little small church in his area. The beauty of the gospel is it extends grace where grace should not be extended. It's justice. You still pursue justice. It's justice and mercy. That's the picture of the cross. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes?